The old Africa has disappeared. Untouched jungles, huge herds of wild game, high adventure, the happy hunting grounds, those are just dreams of the past. Today there's a new Africa, modern and ambitious. The old Africa died amidst the massacres and devastations which we filmed. But revolutions, even for the better, are seldom pretty. America was built over the bones of thousands of pioneers and revolutionary soldiers, hundreds of thousands of Indians and millions of bison. The new Africa emerges over the graves of thousands of whites and Arabs and millions of blacks and over those bleak boneyards that once were the game reserves. What the camera sees, it films pitilessly, without sympathy, without taking sides. Judging is for you to do later. This film only says farewell to the old Africa and gives to the world the picture of its agony. Nairobi, December 12th, 1963, with cries of Uhuru, East Africa celebrates its independence. Uhuru is a new word. It means freedom. The colonialist regiments withdraw, and the church accepts custody of these souvenirs of an embarrassing past. Politics is new to Africa, too. A new problem for a new era. The symbol of the most progressive party, the rooster. Is plucked by the nationalists. There are other new words like communist. Fascist, liberal, radical. In the new spirit of Uhuru, everyone has the right to speak his own peace. There's a lot to fight about. Yet everyone agrees with Yomo Kenyatta accused of being the mastermind behind the Mau Mau, but beloved as the incarnation of Uhuru. I like the English, he once said, in England. The whites must go, 
Africa is for Africans. However, a few months later, he himself will be the one to uphold the rights of the white people who were courageous enough to remain in Kenya. He will become one of the best protectors they have. The first African armies parade into history. the English regiments parade out. Sir Richard Turnbull, ex-governor of Tanganyika, leaves Dar es Salaam. In the garden, his Askaris come to say goodbye. As the British leave, the gardens of Government House are opened to black rulers for the first time. A new era, a great change. But somehow, in the little human ways, there's really little difference. Well, Mr. Nyerere, thanks a lot for everything. It's been a very nice day. Well, very nice weather, I mean. Goodbye, Madam Nyerere. I hope to see you again. And you too. Bye, bye, gentlemen. I, I say, have you, have you by any chance to see my wife? Most embarrassing. Most embarrassing. Politely, with great ceremony, the last governor of the British Empire leaves Tanganyika. But the elegant cordiality reeks of strain. The guest has overstayed his welcome. Here, the screaming sirens and booming cannon are no more impressive than the irritating racket of toy guns. For years, Africa asked Europe to leave, but Europe refused. Then Europe called herself Africa's nursemaid. But Africa grew up too fast and too troublesome. So now, suddenly, Europe abandons her so-called baby just when it needs her the most. Now the Africans stage their party, a well-organized, spontaneous demonstration well run by the police, against African countries still controlled by whites. Portuguese colonialist eggs go first. And South African beer.
It's not as effective as the Boston Tea Party, but the message is almost the same. Africa's free, but still black. Whites made Africa ashamed to be black. Some called blacks the devil's creation. Now, to wipe away that shame, the new Africa creates its own racism, and the devil changes his color. These lessons are taught by government teachers. The white brain is smaller than the black brain. The white man knows this and is afraid. In America, blacks invented the biggest of all bars, but they are still kept in big glass prisons, like slaves. Hannibal was the white man's master. He gave him the signs used for writing. Hannibal also gave him the wheel, which Hannibal had invented. But when he brought it to the white king, the king killed it and ate it. Because they want to become black, Whites lie in the sun by the sea. The white woman is descended from the monkey, and her hair is as straight as a monkey's. The white woman has flabby breasts, so she hides them in white bags. But it's a hard lesson to learn. Here at a state-run beauty contest, even Miss Uhuru hides her breasts in white bags. Mr. Kenyatta, President of the Republic, who was graciously accepted to attend this ceremony, let us now proceed to the first historic election of Miss Uhuru of the sovereign state of Kenya. Do you mind waiting up for that, please? And now the verdict of the jury. Miss Kula, Miss Uhuru, 1963. her admirers to be sure but for centuries many black men yearn for the white woman before Uhuru in her gleaming mansions and her concealing garments she remained an unattainable dream but now for the price of a drink liberated Africans can make that dream come true they can watch the white woman draw aside her mysterious veils and lo there she is revealed at last not in the best light perhaps but certainly not a dream just an ordinary female, aging, mocking, and pale. Say, a buona, wanna take him off? <laughs> Sings believing. But if you've got more money, you can really turn the tables on the past. Top government officials get rich on the profits of Uhuru. Then, for their black babies, they hire white nursemaids. No, dear, you mustn't spit the seeds. Mm -hmm. Use your hands. Yes. with a long white beard. Don't hurt him. Oh, Willie. Why? Pretty white dolly. Now the whites must trust to black hands the defense of their homes and families. Soldiers of the most famous white African regiment, the King's Rifles, hand over their guns. There are no ceremonies, no military honors. It's a matter of fact. Africa has emerged from her long dark ages. She lays down the spear and picks up the rifle.
Africa picks up the whites' police clubs too and begins training a new force. In Kenya, it's urgently needed. The young nation's first independent elections have been scheduled and excitement has reached a fever pitch. During this campaign, irresponsible politicians promised to hand over all the whites' property, houses, cars, lands, and livestock, unprepared for modern democracy but eager to claim their shares. As if they could buy them with their votes, Africans scramble to the polls. But all they get is an age-old lesson meted out with the same old clubs, landing on the same old heads. Uhuru comes late to the white highlands where for over 60 years only whites were permitted to own land, where Kenya's richest farms lie. Here, settlers transform the rough African bush into a little piece of England. Fox doesn't exist in Africa, but you can have a chunk of frozen fox flown in, tie it to the end of a string, and have it dragged around by a black houseboy. Together, they make a fine scent for the hound. <laughs> The British wanted so much to fox hunt in Kenya that they even taught the natives to play the fox's part. But the fox is a wily prey, one which the hunter should never underestimate. This court will now render its decision. In Her Majesty's name, you are found guilty and sentenced to deportation to Maradal Jail to be imprisoned there for 40 years. That is all.
Have you anything to say? Prior arrest? Deal. When the accused was arrested, we found these. In his chamber. Four rifles, a panga, and a pistol. They were made by his associates and himself for the crimes admitted to. Armed with this gun, exhibit uh, number four, together with six of his accomplices, Rashidi Singida, on the night of April the 6th, 1961, entered the farm of the British subject John Fletcher at Aberdare Point and strangled the Ascari on duty, Josefi Nataeli. The second victim of the accused was Miss Elizabeth Regan, sister-in-law of the farm owner, who was killed by Singida by means of a gun shot through the window. Alerted by the shot, Mr. Fletcher ran to the outside stairs and was wounded. Mr. Fletcher crawled into the house to protect his wife and two daughters. The accused and his associates rushed into the living room and finished with their panga knives Mr. Fletcher, his wife and two daughters, 18 and 15 years of age, who had looked for shelter under the table. the three women were found without heads or limbs, while on Mr. Fletcher's body, a former naval officer, 72 panga blows were spotted. Do you confirm your confession to the police? No. Yeah. We take the liberty to point out to your lordship that the accused does not need an interpreter as he knows English. You are sentenced to forced labor for life. Jina lako. Watoa? Sejo. Wakiri kwa mba umu atiani kwa uwaji wa watoto watatu wa kizungu wa shamba la buwana foset. Aa. Hebu, sigiliza mapato ya uchunguzi ya kesi. Tangu miaka kenda wewe ya... Then I shall set forth the facts. For nine years, you were the nanny of Memsa Fawcett's three children. Richard, age two, Mary, age four, and Victor, age nine. You saw their births watched over their games, ate and slept with them. On the night of February the 6th, you opened a window to let Kamata Narua and his gang into the house. Juana Fawcett was taken and butchered on the big green table. The mother and the children ran to the door. Kamata caught them at the door and cut them to pieces before your eyes. I sentence you to life imprisonment. Your Honor, prosecution case against Yomo Kanari, so-called General of the Land's Freedom Army, who escaped together with five Mau Mau accomplices from the Voy Jail, where he was spending a 30 years term. The accused organized at least 100 collective swearings by Mau Mau in the course of which domestic and wild animals were tortured, and obscenities, together with the crime of cannibalism, Besides, the accused is reported to be guilty of vandalism against the local breeders, inasmuch as they were forced to destroy more than 400 head of purebred cattle. The accused and his accomplices had cut with the panga the tendons of their hind legs, so causing horrible pains and permanent injuries. Irrefutable evidence of the accused guilt was supplied by one of the major victims of Canary's vandalistic actions, Mr. Worstworth, who, with his son, followed the band's tracks for 72 days and 72 nights. At Narok, the accused was captured and delivered to the Magadi Post Police. Well, that 
that's that. Those bastards. I consequently ask that the accused be found guilty and sentenced to the maximum penalty provided for by the special law. I sentence you to hard labor for life. December 16, 1964, general amnesty for all Mau Mau. Because their war against the British won Kenya's freedom, because they killed 85 whites and about 5,000 blacks, Kenyatta proclaims them national heroes. Oh, no, no. Kenyatta promises them their country's eternal gratitude in the land of the whites they killed. Few real Mau Mau remain, but the opera is too appealing. 1,400 heroes reach for their rewards. The whites' land trembles under their feet. Thousands prepare to leave. Real estate agency windows are papered with offers. If you don't catch the irony, the terms of sale seem absurd. 99 years to pay. The irony is deliberately funereal, bitter, and pathetic. To whom are staying on? Mr. G. Georges announces with great sorrow that his once prosperous farm has been put up for sale. All friends are kindly requested to dig out all flowers and ornamental plants from the garden before the sale. Holy Farm. For sale. Fraser Farm. For sale. Sutherland Farm. So. Rannis Farm. So. Tarbottom Farm. For sale. Swan Farm. So. Going, going, go. Go to Hasakarani for 54 pounds. Now I have two lovely candlesticks. What am I on? 50. 50, 50. Does anyone offer more? 50 and one, 50 and two, 50 and three. It took three generations to accumulate all this, but now the whites can't take it with them. So they hire Indian merchants to organize auctions, like this one at Kainan Kap in the White Highlands. The auctioneers do a good business. The Africans spend freely. The old house is stripped bare. In the shadows sit sad spectators, the ex-owners, themselves just shadows of the past. Empty and silent, the old farms await new masters. Kenyatta wanted to hurt the pride of the upper-class English colonials. Only the pioneers of the highlands were chased out. The whites living on the plains are left alone.
December 27, 1963, two weeks after independence, Kenya begins its agrarian reform. by Kano Toynbee, an African, comes to mind. Erase every trace of the white man, uproot the tree of his evil, plow under his flower gardens, make them bear fruits. There where only one lived, we will make room for 100. In Kenya, the highlands are a rare oasis of green. Under the British, they were a private white estate. From outside, the Africans admired it and desired it. Now they claim it. Before, when only 150 whites lived here, it was too much for too few. But now, 10,000 Africans want in. Now it's too little for too many. are leaving Kenya in these replicas of ancient wagons loaded down with pots, pans, and families. They are recreating the great trek in which their ancestors fled from Cape Town 130 years ago. The Boers will not wait to be dispossessed. They are the first to go. Their trek is hard and the display is heavy, but the message is crystal clear. It's a reverse version of the Freedom March. It will lead them back a thousand miles from Kenya to South Africa and centuries backwards into the past.
there's new license everywhere. The old laws are suspended, new ones not yet written. Now there's no one to protect the reserves from poachers and meat hunters, black and white. For those who want to rob Africa the most they can in the least possible time, this is the perfect moment. Africa offers a dozen different types of safari. One called the 15-minute safari is just right for the harried businessman. A helicopter picks him up on the roof of his hotel, flies him above all that difficult, dirty forest, then carefully sets him down in a nice, safe place. While he rests, the copter finds an elephant and drives it toward him. It's easy. If you can hit the broad side of a barn, you can't lose. That rented gun is so powerful it could demolish a dinosaur. Hit him anywhere. Such artillery is bound to knock him down. Then you can finish the poor beast off point blank. Two minutes for a snapshot of the moment of triumph. And in a few hours, the great hunter can be back at the office bragging about his heroics. Africans don't have airplanes or powerful rifles, but they've got their ancient know-how and their numbers. So they gang up 10,000 strong, surround an area almost as big as Rhode Island, then pull the noose tight.
Toby, Immigration Sector 13. Water shortage in Sector 16. And giraffes moving to Sector 2. 63 report hippopotami moved from zone 9 to zone 12. Zone 42 signals buffalo moving south east and Mexico to Maji Mazzoli, where they have already... In an old abandoned farmhouse along the Zambezi River, isolated and lonely, are the headquarters of the Wildlife Society. Financed mostly by private English funds using radios and airplanes, the society tries to keep informed on animal movements across a huge section of the continent. Its goal, to rescue as many animals as possible from poacher-infested areas and move them to better protected parts. For millenniums, Africa's animals wandered free obeying only the laws of nature. But now man imposes a new kind of migration, the life of the refugee. This is Operation Crocodile, working in the mouth of the Ruwuma River, which is crawling with poachers. To catch the crocs, harmless traps. Their positions, marked by balloons, are set out during low tide. Last six months alone, poachers have killed over 20,000 crocodiles here. The Wildlife Society can't possibly compete. This operation will save only 82. These lucky ones are knocked out with huge injections of tranquilizer serum. When they wake up, they'll be 250 miles away and safe for the moment. Africa is populated with walking wounded, animals that poachers or hunters didn't quite finish off. So the Wildlife Society has taken on the role of the jungle's Red Cross. To treat a wounded elephant, veterinarians feed their patient pounds of tranquilizers and hope that will keep them cooperative. They make diagnoses, take temperatures, administer medicine, even maintain an animal blood bank. Hold that tail up, won't you? Where the hell has this damn thermometer gone to? Now, 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 hold it, Bessie. There's a good girl. The Game Scouts helicopter is flying over the Tanner River region. Some of the men run into the bush for cover. They are the ivory poachers, the bane of the African game reserves. In this area alone, which is no larger than a London suburb, they have slain 750 elephants. The poachers have grown in number, taking advantage of the crisis caused by the present political transition. The immense heritage of the African fauna is in danger. It has been suggested to call in the United Nations. The problem, however, could be solved if greater financial aid was supplied for the protection of the game by the ex-colonialist states. In the meanwhile, both black and white gamekeepers are doing the best they can to protect the countryside. Hidden deep in the forest, police discovered hundreds of caches of ivory. One modernized army of poachers used hand grenades to massacre 300 baby elephants, all slaughtered only for the tiny tufts of hair at the tips of their tails, out of which they make baubles and bracelets that tourists buy for a few pennies apiece. In less than a year, the police here collected 82 tons of poached ivory. If you consider that this is only one-fifth of the annual poacher's bag, you begin to understand the magnitude of the slaughters. In one valley of the Semliki, police found, drying in the sun, 
2,800 skins of poached zebras, leopards, gazelles, cheetahs, and lions. Once this was the richest reserve in the world. Now the game grows rarer and rarer. Now rotting carcasses poison the air, and the forest is shadowed by huge columns of acrid, greasy smoke rising over the crackling flames of the animals' funeral pyres. The Wildlife Society keeps on trying to protect a few of the living, trying to save some of the wounded, but it's a pathetic losing battle. The massacres continue unabated. Hundreds of animals are butchered every day. Third patrol. <laughs> bird Patrol. John Faraday calling Flying Bird. This is Flying Bird. Come in, Bird Patrol. Over. Found baby zebra, a week old, near mother's body. Killed by poachers with poisonous arrows. Emergency operation needed. Recommend special food, B-16. Acknowledge. Over. Okay, Third Patrol. Message received. We shall see to it. <laughs> All right, get cracking, will you? He's hungry. Righto. The Africa of Vasco da Gama and the great Portuguese explorers, the oldest white Africa south of the Sahara, awakens from a long sleep. For 400 years, nothing has visited this fortress, nothing but the weather. Once the Portuguese Empire stretched from India to the Americas, now all that remain of the glories of the past are crumbling stone ramparts, mute, rusting cannons, and two colonies in Africa. But Portugal is reluctant to give them up. They're all she has. Just outside the crumbling walls, there's a new reality. The guerrilla war of the Angolan nationalist rebels. 
but in the heavy morning mist, the patrolling Portuguese soldiers still seem like ghosts of the past. Whenever man is present, animals and birds hush their normal chatter and the jungle falls silent. It's an unmistakable sign which the rebels know only too well. Now they avoid such pockets of silence. They know that the Portuguese patrols will be there waiting. But after much frustration, the Portuguese have devised a clever solution. Aves artificiais, três, dois, um, vamos. It's a trick that almost always works. Animals and rebels respond to the tape's electric cry, and instantly the jungle fills with life and death. In Angola, the whites claim to ignore the colors of human skin. Aquí es Portugal, they said. Here is Portugal. Brancos y pretos son todos portugueses. Blacks and whites are all Portuguese. But in 400 years until the revolution, less than one half of 1% of Angola's blacks were granted citizenship. So now the rebels say, this is Africa and only blacks are African. White and black. Brancos y pretos an urgent problem that hate is staining blood red. When modern elections ousted them from power because they're a small minority, the Watusi allied themselves with the Chinese communists supposedly champions of the world's masses, and revolted against Rwanda's peaceful majority, the Bahutu. The revolution failed, and the Bahutu took a horrendous revenge. In the forest, gruesome evidence. 54 amputated Watusi hands. This month, January 1964, at least 20,000 Watusi have died, and the Bahutu's revenge has been going on for years. But neither the UN nor any government, black, white, or yellow, has tried to stop the slaughter. The Kagera River carries away thousands of corpses. These Bahutu river folk feel no pity for the Watusi, but for them the Kagera is the source of life. Their drinking water, they must keep it clean. They have worked like this for weeks, weeks of ghoulish fishing, carried out with reluctant diligence, yielding a grotesque harvest.
Ten days and ten nights of exodus along the road to Uganda, the road to safety. When they ruled Rwanda, the Watusi were a rich and arrogant people, cruelly dominating the Bahutu. Now, owning only their cattle, the Watusi are poor refugees begging sanctuary. Landless, homeless, uncomprehending, a people who hardly exist. Answer. Waiting for landing authorization. We are flying over you. We are flying over you. KPN here. Please answer. Over. This is control tower. Authorization refuse it. For the last time you are requested to move on immediately. Quinda. Okay, AFL. We'll try landing anyway. Sounds like they mean business, but despite the warnings, we're determined to land. In Dar es Salaam, we heard that Zanzibar has been thrown into a violent revolution. But because the rebels have cut off all communication with the outside world, no one really knows what's happening here. Rumors are only rumors. Today, we decided to find out the truth. Along with three German newsmen, we hired two light planes and flew across from the mainland. Since Zanzibar airport denies us permission to land, we use an abandoned runway to the north. But the rebels are here, too. German seemed to have landed safely, but as we touch down, we catch a glimpse of them being kicked along by the rebels. Then the rebels drive a truck onto the runway, and we just have time to swerve away and pull up before we crash. The German's plane has been set on fire, but at least we know there's no one inside. They've all been taken prisoner. There's nothing we can do now. To land would be pointless. One more look, and we swing back to Dar es Salaam. But the next day, we return with a helicopter, flying a red flag to confuse the rebels, because rumors say that the revolution is communist-inspired. This time, we head for the center of the island, where refugees say 5,000 Arabs were slaughtered last night. On Sunday, two dozen revolutionaries captured 850 guns and handed them out in the African slums. No one knew how to use them, but that didn't matter. It was open season on Arabs. Excited by propaganda, which stirred up their ancient hatred for Arabs, the Africans turned their revolution into an uncontrolled genocidal extermination. Entire villages burn. The Arabs machine gun. Trucks loaded with Arab corpses carting them off to mass graves. Politicians call such scenes embarrassing. And so they are. To the old colonialists who created their own racism and allowed other racisms to fester, then abandoned Africa to those merciless passions. To the new rulers who are creating new racisms and to the new exploiters east and west who spread false promises so they can increase their own profits or power. The Arab leaders have escaped to the mainland with the Sultan. These are Zanzibar's poor Arabs, thousands and thousands, petty shopkeepers and small landowners. Now, as always, the poor and the innocent will pay for the sins of their ancestors, who 150 years ago turned Zanzibar into the cruelest slave market the world ever saw, and for the crimes of their leaders, who try to continue in modern times that ancient oppression. Wrapped in white robes, already more like ghosts than men, hundreds await their deaths in an impromptu grave. Ancient Muslim cemeteries turned into modern extermination camps. 
women and children trembling under the muzzles of the rebels' guns. Huge mass graves dug deep, deep in the forest for concealment, already half full of Arab corpses. Again, the Muslim cemetery. But today, there's been no time to finish the business of burial. And one of the most pitiful scenes in history's brutal anthology of death. Thousands of Arabs fleeing into the sea. A desperate race to an impossible salvation. Then, the next day. were the great game reserves, huge sections of the continent transformed by the British into the world's most perfect natural sanctuaries. Here, the British game laws classified man as the most destructive of animals. Here, except for man, all the animals were sacred. Man could tiptoe along the boundaries, but he could not put one foot inside. Even then, dedicated wardens watched his every move and demanded absolute silence. <laughs>
This is the old Africa. This must have been the way it was millenniums ago, when man had not yet been created, when apes were the only creatures to walk on two legs. The same ancient silence, the sovereign harmony, the perfect, undisturbed divine balance, the natural paradise. This must have been the way it was in the Garden of Eden, just before man was thrown out. the dawn of February 25th, 1964. The national parks, which up to now have been inviolate, are profaned. It has been decided that there is no longer any place in the new economy for these immense, unproductive territories. Now the new African government put the parks to use. The game wardens, both black and white, have no choice but to comply with governmental orders and to organize the details of Operation Cropping also known as the animal harvests. Here in Uganda, as of today, on every Friday, Operation Cropping will stock the local butcher shops with fresh meat. Now, in those sanctuaries where once it was sacrilegious even to whisper, rifles shatter the ancient silence. March 25th, 1964, Murchison Falls National Park, Elephant Harvest. Queen Elizabeth National Park, Hippopotamus Harvest.
160. That's the total of today's harvest on the hippopotamus ranch. Local butchers buy them all for about $40 a piece. The number to be harvested is determined by two factors. Africa, which is starving for protein, must be fed. And the market prices must be kept stable. The number slaughtered is exact. 100, 500, 1,000. But not one more or less. Once the quota is filled, silence returns. And the other animals stay alive for another week yawning lazily in the same waters where until yesterday nobody shot at them with anything except a tourist camera. The harvesting itself is child's play. Just blast away. The herds are so thick and so trusting that you're bound to hit something. Babies, tough old males, pregnant mothers. They all bring a good price. And there are plenty more where these came from, at least for a while. An order for 45 elephants, it's filled in a jiffy. Once, these monsters were Africa's most ferocious beasts. But now, used to the safety of the old sanctuaries, they can be led like lambs to the slaughter. That's true both for those terrible tuskers suffering from tooth trouble and for the legendary pregnant females. The truth is that today in Africa, as in the rest of the modern world, there's only one hungry, ferocious beast, man. But Africa wants it both ways, meat on its tables and the myth of the animal paradise for the tourists. Wounded animals limping away from the harvest are destroyed immediately. Above all, the tourists mustn't know. But since even most tourists don't get to Africa, we'd like to offer our own snapshot of the famous animal sanctuaries. This is edition 1964, Slaughter Paradise number one, the richest meat market in the world. Don't worry, down there in the water, a few hippos are still left for next Friday. Here's another souvenir snapshot. This one's a must for the latest, most up-to-date brochure for a trip through the animal paradise. That inviolate sanctuary of our planet's disappearing wildlife. That sacred shrine of nature where even whispering was forbidden. Because today your trip can be a lot more jolly. You can shout, scream, curse, and romp around to your heart's content. You won't disturb anyone. Man, the most destructive of animals, has already passed this way. You can follow his trail for miles and miles, right across the heart of Africa, an endless panorama of desolation and death. animal sanctuaries to enter another sanctuary, South Africa, the sanctuary of the whites. The break seems sharp and clean, here order and luxury, back there turmoil and hunger. South Africa's whites claim that the break is absolute. To the cry of Africa for the Africans, the whites respond, this isn't Africa. And the change is so abrupt, the country is so prosperous, that this could almost seem true.
When the whites first arrived in Cape Town, they found relatively few blacks. Now the blacks outnumber them four to one. Now the blacks say, this is Africa, their Africa, which the whites have taken from them, which they want back. And if this is not Africa, then what is it? If it's not the last point on the African continent, then it's not in the world at all. It must be unreal, imaginary, a glittering fabrication of castles in the sky. Tribal dances and heavy breasts offered to the glory of nature now exists only in legend and on film. Here they're shooting a sequence on the Zulus, the fierce warrior tribe that once almost took That's South right, Africa from the face. Boers. Come on, come on, more action! But today's Zulu girls demand high union wages to strip off their nylons and dance their grandmother's okay. dances. The For them, the ancient rhythms of the tom-tom have long since disappeared. Today, during their work breaks, they pound out some very new variations.
The African female has learned to be a modern woman. In the past, when she walked nude, she was bought and sold like cattle. That past, she knows, works against her. Now she will be wooed and courted, wondered at and sought out. Now she hides herself, not from shame, but from strategy. Bare, she was fair game. Covered, she's a mystery. Bare, she was bartered. Dressed, she can decide for herself. Aggressively, like a tyrant, like the white woman. So, knowingly, the old Africa covers itself and disappears. <laughs> Some of the new governments not only encourage modern modesty, they impose it. Enthusiasm everywhere often leads to excess. We in Europe have witnessed worse things. In the Sudan, that great organ of the modern world, the Legion of Decency, distributes thousands of pairs of underpants, all the same size, to the wild tribes. These warriors, once so ferocious, now receive them meekly. Meekly they agree to care for their drawers, with all the respect due government property. Of all the things that need hiding in Africa, if this is not quite the most urgent, at least it's a beginning, and at least the Legion of Decency is satisfied. Never before has a warrior slipped on shorts. Never before has a lion climbed a tree. The fact is, times have changed. In the new Africa, the old kings are in disgrace. Take the ex-king of beasts. Today, his roar doesn't frighten anyone. While other animals flee from poachers and hunters, the ex-aristocrat, ex-terror of the jungle, climbs trees to catch lizards. Poor king of the forest. His ex-reputation stalks him and makes his humiliation public. Tourists flock to see him. Where's the lion? There's the lion. What's the lion doing? All day long. They won't even give him a moment of privacy.
Encouraged by his natural laziness, the lion has given up hunting. Why bother? Park wardens do his hunting for him. Not only that, they deliver the meat right to his doorstep, in places easily accessible to tourists, and far away from such unpicturesque truths as the Friday harvests. <laughs> The ex-king of beasts has retired. Now he's just a weary old man on welfare who gets his daily exercise by irritably shooing away the birds. Salam, January 1964. Another revolt has exploded, this time in Tanganyika. What began as a minor army protest over wages has turned into race war. Just as in Zanzibar, the ancient African hatred of Arabs has broken loose. Muslim blood flows freely everywhere, but especially in Bagamoyo, the port where long ago the Arabs used to round up the slaves before loading them onto slave ships. Already the mortuaries are full and the cadavers overflow into the sun. Patiently, the vultures wait for the inspection to finish so that they can begin their own. President Nairi has gone into hiding. The police have disappeared, and mutinous army troops have taken over the city, but they make no effort to control the rioting crowds. Dar es Salaam is toppled into anarchy. For us, it is almost suicidal to travel through the streets. We are chased away, threatened and insulted. We try to reach the Arab quarter, but everywhere, crowds hide from our cameras the bloody evidence of the massacre. On Ocean Road, a Muslim tries to escape a crowd of Africans by running out into the sea. When the crowd overtakes him, he is drowned. The Africans feel that the Arabs now exploit them as pitilessly as the whites used to. Because of this, they demolish Arab shops and houses. Dozens of Arabs have put to the wall. Someone has killed three mutineers, so now there must be a reprisal. But we're not welcome at the execution. They scream at us and threaten us with machine guns. When we stall to get some good shots, one of the soldiers loses his temper. One of us is cut by the flying glass, but there's no question of treatment. The mutineers jerk us out of our car and haul us to the wall. They're about to execute us when a rebel officer sees one of our passports and shouts, wait! These aren't whites, they're Italians. <laughs> Leopoldville, June 26, 1964. Moisey Chombe, the exiled rebel whose secessionist Katanga government held off the United Nations troops for over two years, returns to the Congo. Almost as much of the country is controlled by communist-supported rebels is by the Western-supported government. But Chambe boasts that he can clean up the mess in just three months. Now he's no longer a villain. Now he's the Congo's savior. But mass enthusiasm is short-lived in these parts. In a few months, Chambe will again be defined as the enemy of his country and sent into exile. November 24th, 1964. Five months after Chambe takes over Stanleyville, the rebels' capital is captured by American-transported Belgian paratroopers and by American-supplied white mercenaries. The city is littered with unburied, rotting corpses. Here in the Congo, these new atrocities have old roots. Half a century ago, the white colonials used to cut off the hands of the blacks who didn't work fast enough. During that period, so much killing and torture 
was so cruelly and persistently practiced that the black population decreased from 20 million to 12. And now we reap what we have sown. The rebels' leaders told them that their arrows were more powerful than guns, that they were protected by a magic spell that turned bullets to water. Doped up on drugs, believing themselves invulnerable, they marched into a massacre. Now ants, flies, and the sun stripped their cadavers to skeletons. They're granted no honors, no graves. They died without knowing what they fought for, without knowing that the Congo had become a battlefield for the Cold War, in which they were just unimportant dupes. Guns at ready, Belgian paras and white mercenaries force rebel prisoners to carry out this grisly cleanup. The rebels in Stanleyville killed 74 whites, trapped 80 children in their schoolhouse and burned them to death, and raped four white nurses. 12,000 black enemies of the revolution were tortured, killed, and often eaten. dead flesh decaying in the equatorial heat. Nine nuns, seven missionaries, and four white children were tied together with wire and shot in the mouths. Many of the whites' bodies had been slashed open at the stomachs so that the rebels could eat the liver. At Leopoldville Airport, American C-130 transport planes unload the survivors of the horrors of Stanleyville. Less than 24 hours ago, they were lined up under the muzzles of the rebels' machine guns. Then, 320 Belgian paratroopers floated down out of the sky, burst into the city and put 7,000 rebels to flight. The rescue took only 10 minutes, but 74 whites are missing at roll call. The wounded were pulled out from under a pile of corpses that included the Americans Carlson and Ryan. Five of these wounded, among them a raped woman, died later at Leopoldville Hospital. They wouldn't even have made it to the hospital, nor would the thousand other rescued whites have made it out of Stanleyville had it not been for the American planes. But without the American planes, neither would the Belgian paras have hooked up with the white mercenaries and captured Stanleyville for the Western-supported Congo government. Two days later, knowing this and disregarding the mission of mercy, the Organization of African States accused the USA of unlawful interference in internal Congolese affairs. All right, pull them out of here. We're flying northeast of Stanleyville, over the border between the Congo and the Sudan. In the mission below, more than 100 nuns, priests, and children are held captive by one band of the 6,000 rebels who control the Aturi forest. For eight days now, UN and government planes have dropped supplies over the mission. These always end up in rebel hands, but there's no alternative. The rebels have threatened to slaughter all the captives if one parachute opens or one helicopter lands. This time, the government keeps its side of the bargain, but the rebels don't. On the ninth day, when we fly over the mission again, there's no one waiting.
We met them one by one. The reasons why Chambi is so cocksure that he can clean up the Congo mess. His white mercenaries. They're the world's last soldiers of fortune, outdated relics of the past. They're outcasts from the modern world, which expelled them, or from which they fled. On the lamb from an infamous past, pursuing a restless present, a burnt out adventure, a dead fate. They're all ex-something, ex-anti-guerrilla fighters from French Algeria, British Malaysia, Borneo, or Kenya, ex-SS officers from Germany, ex-CIA pilots from Cuba, ex-farmers from Kenya, ex-residents of the Sudan, Egypt, Tanganyika, ex-students from South Africa and Southern Rhodesia. Some follow a macabre ideal of glory and adventure. Some believe they're fighting a last-ditch battle against communism. Some are known as les affreux, the horrors, who just love war. Two days ago, 15 of them tore Kisaka from the grasp of over 400 rebels. Tomorrow, 40 of them will try what the entire Congolese army couldn't achieve, the conquest of Boendi. Alors, si j'ai bien compris, le 54 arrivera à Boende avec le Tigny. Si le Rafio marche, hein? Eh bien, moi, je vais contrôler les hommes et les bagnoles. Moi, je m'en vais avec le 52 et je vous rejoindrai à Boende le 24. Faites gaffe au noir. Merde! Tais-toi! Mais merde! Salope! Des renseignements. Une fois Boende tombé, nous attaquerons immédiatement Beaufalais. Merde! Beaufalais, pas de problème. 3 400 noirs, tous drogués. Merde! Et bien entendu, les gars, sans roupiller, sans baiser, sans bouffer. Merde! Attack on Boende will use air power. Air power means these two 20-year-old American T-6s, rickety antiques held together by chewing gum and string. Their pilots are Tom O'Keefe and Somerset Wilson, ex-Rhodesians whose families were murdered by the Angolan rebels. They've rented their planes and themselves to Chambi for $500 a month and a life insurance policy. So far, they haven't been paid and they haven't found an insurance company to underwrite the policy, but still they fly, with limping motors over rebel-infested jungles for free. Today, as they left, they signed the required forms in their usual way. Destination, hell. Reason for flight, personal business. October 22nd, 1964. The attack on Boende. Hey! Off the trucks and take cover! Off the trucks and take cover!
pull you far. All right, hold it. <laughs> For three months, these nuns and priests lived in a nightmare of fear. The rebels have been taught to strike at the white man through his god, the god of the white skin, the god responsible for the unending arrogance of his worshippers. Right against the wall. Hands up there. Oh, oh my dear. Oh, give me. Right, let's see him. What are you, my lady? The victors have no sympathy for their prisoners. Today, it's the rebels' turn to suffer. But tomorrow, when the mercenaries move on, other rebels will return. Then it will be someone else's turn. It's an endless cycle, a dance of death that's lasted five years. It's worse now because the Cold War has moved in. Black against white, east against west, black against black. No one ever wins. No one finally loses, except the dead. Under the swarming ants and flies and the pitiless sun, they rot together, black and white, with absolute biological equality. At least for the moment, to the winners go the spoils. At Buendi, the mercenaries discovered a rebel government strongbox. When they blew it open with a bazooka, they found 50 million Congolese francs. This fortune was not saved to finance the revolution. It was to finance Plan OK, according to which 3,000 rebel troops were to invade the USA. America is saved. The mercenaries take the folding money and the Congolese soldiers get the small change. Like all such innocent dreams of grandeur, Plan OK is indefinitely postponed. Meanwhile, in reality, the soldiers get drunk over a victory as worthless as their plunder. Guests at a banquet where they get only the crumbs. For centuries, the Congo has been starving for bread. But today, these soldiers are rich in everything that's worthless. Formal tails for a black tie dinner, sun hats for a white man's safari. They can't take it with them, and they can't sell it. But at least they can dream. The right to plunder is granted for 24 hours. Time ran out 10 minutes ago. But how come if you could loot 10 minutes ago, you can't now? Down. A good Congolese soldier fighting for his country will never figure it out. Keeping bastard. Ah! Call yourself a policeman, eh? You're worse than the others. Hold there! 
He'll never figure out why the whites make such a fuss to find out who ate this fellow's liver. Or why you need a court to sentence this rebel who burned alive 27 children trapped in their school. Or why they've arrested those soldiers who raped those rebel bitches in their prison cells. Or why you need so many men and so many rifles to kill one little unarmed rebel. when you need only one shot to kill one so much bigger and stronger. Okay, take him out of here, put him against the wall and shoot him. <laughs> But in Africa, life explodes as powerfully as death. Here in South Africa, for every white baby, five blacks are born. Frightened, the whites have set up a system of complete racial segregation, apartheid. In their castle in the sky, they claim it can work. But in reality, it's an impossible, hysterical defense. And the longer it endures, the more it threatens to change the joyous smiles of the new generations into the grim lines of hate. Take the thing lying at your feet. This big spoon is called a shovel. It is your friend, which will give you bread, beer, and many wives. It must never keep still. It must go backwards and forwards all day. You shall put it down with a sunset. What is a shovel? My friend! What does the shovel give you? But South Africa needs all that young black labor. You? There's not even enough at home. So it takes refugees from other African countries. And if they're unskilled and illiterate, it can teach them the necessities at almost no expense. Who then is your friend? The More than a third of the world's diamonds come out of this earth. In South Africa, the white man is rich in diamonds, but poor in foresight. This wealth, which he could now share with his black-skinned citizens, could be taken from him tomorrow. 50% of the whites are against the continuation of the present racist policy. Many others hesitate, fearing the same fate that befell Sudan, Algeria, Egypt, Congo, or Zanzibar. Since 1652, the Boers have been here, working the land as farmers. 100 years ago, they struck gold, lots of gold. Now South Africa produces more gold than any other country in the world. The whites claim that this gold is theirs. Certainly, the technology and the industry is. But for every 100 white technicians who work in the mines, and for every single ingot of gold that comes up from the mines, 1,000 blacks put in a long, hard day's work. Clearly, the whites need the blacks, and the blacks need the whites. But increasingly, with every passing day, the only emotions between them become distrust and hate. The black man is a child just out of the trees. This is a racist statement. Only the black man is an African. 
This too is a racist statement. And as such slogans spread, so does the hate. And so Johannesburg, the city of gold, becomes a segregated prison. Segregated, the blacks are locked in. Segregated, in their gilded cage, the whites are afraid to leave. When the mines were opened, the Bantus flocked down out of the mountains in search of work. Other blacks flooded in from Angola, Mozambique, the Congo, and the Sudan, and still they slip across the borders. Today, they number more than 11 million. They march in waves to the entrances of the mines and split up into rivers that flow down into the labyrinth that spreads out beneath the city. directly under Johannesburg, and the rock that separates blacks from whites is riddled with holes, like a great Swiss cheese. Like Christians in the catacombs, the miners slip from tunnel to tunnel, eating deeper and deeper into the city's foundations. The vaults tremble, and the miners run for cover. But above, though each explosion shakes the city, no one moves. For years now, no one has even noticed. Stock exchange booms. Senator Kennedy tours South Africa to plead against apartheid. But new orders for mining shares are cabled in from New York. South Africa is expelled from the Commonwealth, but London buys more shares every day. The communists offer black revolutionaries their open support. But on March 10th, Moscow bought two million carats of diamonds. And on May 12th, Peking ordered 50 tons of gold. Meanwhile, like the chart of the rising stock prices, the miners' course moves ever upwards. The clamor of the exchange grows shriller and more excited, but the crust separating the two worlds grows ever thinner and begins to crumble. Now, more and more, as if by the crashing waves of a rising tide, the shrill of the exchange is drowned out by the blasts of the miners' explosions. At the end of the Ice Age, a warm ocean current broke off a giant ice flow from the southern ice cap and bore a little colony of penguins here to the Cape of Good Hope. Stranded when their ice flow melted in the sun, for centuries they've been strangers in a foreign country which grows ever hotter and more hostile, surrounded by a sea mounting in depth and fury. Soon, if these waters do not calm, one giant angry wave will wrench them away forever from this last rock at the furthest tip of the black continent. 